David Tanquiri, United States Army, Korea, the Forgotten War. I had the pleasure and honor of interviewing David years ago in Independence, Missouri. It was June 28, 2007. David enlisted in the United States Army, served with the 24th Infantry Division in the Reconnaissance Company as an infantryman and a scout, and he fought in Korea. Has a powerful story. I actually did a, did a Veterans Day program with David the next year in 2008 at Johnson Community College here in Kansas. So we've, we've stayed in touch over the years. He's one of my favorite Korea War veterans. And I'm blessed to be able to bring this to you today on the Voices of History channel, folks. Brandon Glidden, again, thank you. Big thank you for sponsoring this story and making it possible for many others to hear and to listen to David's story. So thank you, Brandon, and thank you for your service to our country. Folks, I'd like you to consider becoming the sponsor of one of these stories. I have many of them. The interviews are done. Like I said, they're in my archives. I don't monetize my videos. No commercials here. I don't want to interrupt these programs. These stories are very important to me. So I would ask that you, the viewers and listeners, would please help sponsor these stories and or donate to my work, make it possible for others to hear and to listen to these amazing stories of history. History is best learned from those who are there. And these men and women were there, folks. So I encourage you to do that. There's information in the video description in the comment section of the video and on my website, LarryCapetto.com. Thank you for watching and sharing these videos, folks. I really appreciate it. Freedom is not free. Freedom is earned. And these stories contain what it takes to stay free in this country, folks. And we still do have some freedoms and we want to fight and protect them. So God bless you. Thank you for watching, sharing, and subscribing to this channel. Talk to you again. One, 1952, it was the 24th Infantry Division, and I was in the reconnaissance company of the 24th Infantry Division. Okay, I was, was your MOS? Well, I don't remember the number, but I was a combat infantryman, and I was a scout in the reconnaissance company. Okay. And at the time, were you, you enlisted, obviously? Yes, in about a month after the Korean conflict began. I enlisted. What did, our, what did we know about Korea at that time? Because today nobody knows a lot, but at that time, uh, early 50s, what was your knowledge of it, the involvement, and why we were there? Um, okay. Well, at the end of the Second World War, Korea had always been one country before then, and actually it was uh, occupied by the Japanese forces. At the end of the Second World War, the United States and, and uh, the USSR basically divided the country between North Korea and South Korea and divided it at the 38th parallel. And so, and, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and, and then in 1950, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. And that, and we had a, well, we went to the UN and that's why it's called a police action uh, because it was not technically a war. We didn't really go to war. We just, uh, we had a treaty and agreements that we would, help the South Koreans in case of invasion. And so that's what we did. Did you feel a sense of duty to serve your country back then? Uh, tough question. I, I may have, but it doesn't really hit me that that was it. It's kind of strange, you know. I grew up here in Kansas City, and I lived not too far from the Liberty Memorial. And so I knew all about the First World War from having visited there when I was young. I was a teenager during the Second World War, and believe it or not, we played war games. Uh, most of us teenagers did. And so, you know, I was familiar with the Second World War. I knew a lot of people that were in the Second World War. Um, so I don't know, there was part, I suppose part of it was a matter of, of uh, duty to the country. It was also an upsetting time because they were talking about the draft and you couldn't be sure whether you're, you, you were going to be drafted. Mm -hmm. There was also 
uh, prospect of being able to go to college and have a scholarship because of the, of the GI Bill. Um, yeah, there was also an adventuresome, adventuresome spirit of a 20 year old. I'm sorry, what was your job in the military again? Okay. You, you don't know the number of the MOS, but. Oh, infantry? yes, infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually a scout in a reconnaissance company. Okay. Important job. Now, when you went to Korea, or in your basic training, did you know you were going to go to Korea pretty much? Yes. Um, I had basic training at Fort Riley, Kansas, which is about 125 miles from here. And most of the people I went to basic training with were shipped over immediately after basic training. I was at Fort Riley for, and for a year. Mm -hmm. I went to leadership school there, and then I was uh, working there in, in off, doing some office work and other things. And then I shipped out to what was called FECOM, Far East Command, in those days. In fact, a year, uh, 56 years ago, today I was in Japan on my way to Korea. Today? Wow. Yeah, I arrived in Korea on July the 2nd, how 1951. Old were, how, how old were you then? I was 20. I'll be 21 in July the 20th next month. So I was 20 years old then. And, um, long time ago? Does it seem like yesterday? Um, it seems like a long time ago. Um, can you tell me some of the uh, memories of, of landing in Korea the first time you arrived by boat or by plane and what, what you experienced as far as the country? Um, I, I arrived in Pusan by boat, Japanese boat, and then we rode a train. From there, we went north uh, all the way to um, Seoul. No, I'll take it back. We went to Yong, Yongdongpo, which is about 10 miles uh, um, from Seoul, and then um, that's where that's where we ended up, Young Young Dung Po. And the the month and the year is fifty one. July, yes, July of fifty one. Did you know anything about the Chosen Reservoir, the the battle that had gone on there? Um, boy, tough question again because I, I probably did because. I worked at the Kansas City Star newspaper when the war started, in fact, for about a year and a half before it did. And so I read daily news. I read, you know, I kept up with news. So I probably did know quite a bit that had happened in Korea, at least what was in the newspapers. Because that's one of the more publicized conflicts was the Chosen Reservoir, the, the winter of 50, 51. And then yes. the army was overrun at, just yes. prior to that. Did you... Uh, that was a pretty bad situation. Nobody yes. even knows about it, but it, it happened. So, um, well, yeah, it, it was really bad. I mean, uh, one of the elements in Korea that, that we haven't really faced in, in other wars is the is the cold weather. I mean, you're talking about twenty to thirty degrees below zero with wind chill indexes of forty and fifty in the in the mountains of North Korea, and that's that's devastating just just trying to survive that let alone being shot at and shooting and, and this sort of thing so um, that was a very bad time and we lost a lot of people frostbite and freezing in Korea now did you experience any of the cold while you were there oh yes tell me about your experiences and, and how that affected what you were doing and, and the, the other troops um, hmm. I remember one night I was going out on patrol and I had foolishly taken my mittens off and laid them down during the afternoon and they were frozen when I got ready to leave. And so I had to go without any mittens. And I was fearful about what was going to happen, but I managed to, to uh, stay out most of the night sitting on the side of a snow-covered hill and I kept my hands warm in my crotch and in my armpits. And I didn't, my fingers didn't freeze. And, um, but, you know, you, you just had to be aware of, the, of that cold. And, and you're outside all of the time. You, you know, you're never inside. Sure, we had bunkers, and they're, they're uh, covered. Um, well, they've got uh, dirt on them and rocks and, and some logs and that sort of thing. But you're still outside, and they're open. There's no heater. There's nothing. I mean, you're, you're outside in that cold. And it's 24 hours a day. Are you trained for those situations, or do you just encounter them as they happen? Uh, you just encounter them as they happen. Um, no, there was no training for that for that kind of weather. 
Um, you know, we live in this country. We go to we come indoors at night. You know, we take a shower in the morning. I mean, when you're out in the field like that, it's uh, survival, right? I mean, uh, yes. Yeah, so for, for example, I. I I was in one place on the main line of resistance, the MLR, all the way from late November to mid-January. Um, I was in there about, oh, about 43 days, and I never went off the hill. I never shaved. I never brushed my teeth. I never changed my clothes. You didn't, and the water was frozen. You couldn't be using water. You didn't have extra water to be doing anything. Um, so you know, you. Um, I mean, that's just the way it was. You just threw your clothes away when you finally got off that hill. I mean, but, um, well, and I can remember on Christmas Day, 1951, they brought us, a, we could get one warm meal a day. It took them all morning to bring it up, and then it took them all afternoon to take the stuff away and go back on, on this mountain. And I can remember on Christmas Day, it was snowing, and they came up and gave us a hot meal, and we had our mess kits. And by the time it got f full and we got back to where we could eat, it was covered with snow. Um, but you know, two and three feet of snow, temperatures uh, very low, and um, water. Uh, your sleeping bag, winter sleeping bag, was one of the lifesavers because it would thaw out your water. It would thaw out the the food that you had that was in tin cans. That was in cans. Um, it would thaw it out at night. If you take it to bed with you. Tell me about uh, just some of the combat you experienced in Korea. Um, was it, uh, were you guys advancing? Were you holding a line? Tell okay. me about some of the combat. Um, no, I, fortunately I was not in a situation where we advanced or had to, had to capture things. Ours was a fairly small unit. It was a company of about 240 men. And one of the things about us, we were mobile. We moved, we could pack up everything in, in 10 minutes and move if we were asked to. We, we did it many times. And, you know, several miles perhaps. Um, we pulled a lot of outpost duty, that is on outposts beyond the line, and we also did foot patrols out beyond the outposts. Um, and the, the, well, the one that I mentioned where we were on the main line of resistance all the way from November up into January, and we were on a I think that it was 880 meter hill or, or mountain. And um, so we were right there on the main line with that one. But even there, we pulled our outfit, pulled patrols every day and every, every uh, evening. Now, it wasn't, you didn't necessarily go on, on every one of them. I mean, because there were 240 people or, or well, less than that actually on that hill. But you, your outfit pulled and there might be 10 people, there might be 20, might be 30 in a patrol. You'd go out on ambush patrols uh, to try to ambush the enemy, try to capture the enemy. In some cases, they were um, actually combat patrols. You went out and tried to cause damage to the to the enemy. Are you fighting the Chinese? Yes. Tell me about the enemy. Um, huh. Well, you just knew... Well, you knew several things. You, you knew that there were a lot of them, a lot more of them than there were of you. But they didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the artillery. They didn't, you know, as much as, as we had. They just didn't have the, that kind of uh, military equipment. So um, they weren't as prepared to, to engage in combat. You know, I, I can remember one night seeing some of them. Uh, we were on an outpost and we were hit. They had gotten in between us and the line, and they came, and some of them weren't carrying weapons. They'd pick up the weapons of somebody else that got hit. Um, and there were, there, well, I can remember, I think a boy about 14, we, he got severely injured one night in a firefight, and he was probably 14 or 15 years old. Um, they just weren't as well equipped. Their, their equipment just wasn't wasn't as good as ours. How close did you get to them? Oh, like, like we are? Oh, yeah. Hand to hand or? E yes. Fixed bayonets? Uh, no. I remember one night uh, I was lying on my back because we, we were running out of ammunition. I had one clip, eight rounds. 
And I remember being, and you had trench around, around the uh, outpost. And there were some bunkers along it, but you had a trench. And I can remember finally getting down in the trench and getting on my back with my rifle up in the air because I didn't want to miss. Um, now, fortunately, no, none of them came uh, over the trench, and I, I didn't end up. They Actually, we, we probably killed most of them, so they didn't get tested. But, but flares were going off. They were firing artillery at us, and our own artillery was firing around us to try to help protect us because they knew we were low on ammunition. And they'd throw in uh, flares so that we could see. We also had gasoline cans set up at certain strategic positions with white paint on them so that we could shoot them in the night, and, and then they would burn, and that would give you light to see what was going on. Um, what was your rank? I was a private. Now, I may have been a PFC by then, but I'm not sure. Somewhere along, uh, somewhere I became a PFC, um, in the, but I'm not sure when it was. What was uh, one of the harder encounters with the enemy that you remember being over there with? Was it, uh, I mean, sporadic fire? Were there some pretty heavy engagements? Or what was maybe the hardest battle that you fought? Hmm. Um... Well, okay, I think one of the most frightening was uh, an evening, it was in November 1951, and the Chinese apparently hit our, all of our line. They hit it with, with artillery, and it started just after dusk. And so, and we, we were on an outpost, there were probably 30 of us maybe on an outpost. And the shells started coming in. Now, fortunately, they were going beyond us. They were, they were hitting the main line of resistance. But, you know, for a long time, the whole place was just lit up with the, with the uh, artillery shells hitting. And um, I had been, uh, I had had some experience on incoming uh, mortars, so I knew what, what that was like. And, you know, the artillery coming in, and they're whizzing over our head. Um, that can be a rather frightening experience because you realize there, you know, that it's it's really um, something's going on. Um, so I think that was poor, probably more frightening and and, and uh, worse for me than than the um, uh, hand to hand or the the small arms uh, fire. Um, I discovered something about myself and I didn't realize it until I, until I got into it. Uh, I became somewhat aggressive, uh, which was uh, surprising to me, but I did. I, I wanted to know what was going on and where I was and, and things, and so I was somewhat aggressive. I remember one night, I, um, the guy next to me was a Second World War sergeant. He, he had been in the Second World War, so he knew a lot of things that were going on that I didn't know. He could tell by sounds of things. He would tell me what was going on. Um, I can remember a concussion grenade going off right on the edge of our trench, and it shook us up for a little while. And then I can remember later that night hearing the bullets go over my head they, because they make a popping sound. And they were firing burp guns and, and such things at us. And so, you know, you knew you were you were being hit. We had some casualties uh, where we were. Um, Is there a feeling of invincibility of, for the young men? And do you lose that when the firing starts? Um, okay. No, basically all the time I was there, uh, it was not a feeling of invincibility, but I had no uh, feeling that I was going to die. Um, you know, that just wasn't... Uh, one night on, on a patrol, I was sitting on a hill, however, uh, snow-covered hill, and it was probably midnight or 2 o'clock in the morning, and there were, we had search, we used searchlights that we put up in the air in Korea on top of the mountains, and so they would give you some light out there so you could... You could see some things. And I remember sitting on the side of a hill in the snow, and I was sitting there, and I was thinking to myself, what a godforsaken place to die. But that's about as close as I got to it. Otherwise, I, I, um, I didn't anticipate dying. I didn't expect to die. And um, 
you get focused well on doing your job and you get focused on surviving. How about friends that you might have lost? Uh, were you with them? Were they killed, wounded, anybody that you knew personally? Um, I was not with them. Oh, in October of 51, I, I met a lieutenant um, and had an evening of conversation with him, became acquainted with him, realized that he had a couple of young children. And two weeks later, he was killed. On a, he was leading a patrol, and he was killed. And I guess that that uh, shook me up a little bit. We and and other casualties of of people that I knew. Now, I I can't say that I was close friends with with any of the people that I was with in Korea. There I, there was just no close friendship. No camaraderie, though. Well, yeah, but it but it was momentary, and it was it was not long lasting thing. I I've never. I only met one person since I've been in Korea that I was in Korea with, and, I, and he didn't really remember me. Um, but uh, no, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can explain it. But um, it's okay. Um, they refer to Korea as the Forgotten War. Why do you think that is? Good question. Um, let me point out to you that the CBS blurb that you referred me to about your about all of your thing. You go to it and read it, and it doesn't mention Viet it doesn't mention Korea. No, it was the World War II. Focus. Yeah, well, it also, yeah. but it talks about Vietnam and others, but it doesn't oh, mention okay. Korea. But you know, because they mentioned the others, and I don't worry, why didn't they mention Korea? Um, I don't know. I, I suspect that there was part of it was overshadowed by the Second World War because that was the big one, and that was the generation, and that was the that was the big one. So I think part of it was that. I think there was also, you know, there was no victory in Korea, and it lingered, it's still still going on. It hasn't been settled yet. But uh, so I think that's part of the reason there was no definitive victory. There was nothing, and you know, and we still have troops there. Um, so I suspect that was part of part of what it is. Other than that, I don't really know. Um, life pretty much got back to what you might call normalcy by the 1950s. If you go back and look at what was going on in the United States in the 1950s, um, you know, we'd already been through a war, and so we were getting on past that war, and that was a little thing that happened over there in Korea. And, um, it involves some people, but not not in nothing like the numbers of the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think you know that's probably part of it. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, but as far as your involvement in Korea, you know, in combat, um, what else can you tell me about what you experienced and the objective objectives that you guys had and. Um, you know, are you pushing them back? Are they pushing you back? I mean, is it, uh, you know what I'm saying? Are you, okay, are you, yeah. Are you, All right, you now. Jungle, mountaintop, desert? I mean, where are you at? Yeah, uh, we were in mountains all of the time. Um, now, you didn't have, I didn't have grandiose ideas about what was going on, and, and most of the fellows that I was with didn't either. As a matter of fact, when you're a private, and under these circumstances, you don't know much about what's going on except what you can see. I mean, you hear rumors and things, but, but you really don't know much. You don't have maps. You don't, you're not privy to what's going on in terms of strategy or anything. Somebody gives you an order to do something or to move, and you do it. And so, um, you know, you get the stars and stripes occasionally. You can read a little bit about it. They'll, they'll tell you a little bit. But... Uh, you know, there were light skirmishes or there was heavy fighting and such and such uh, two days ago or someplace. But you're pretty much limited to what you see in front of you and what's what's going on right there. That's that's about all you know. Um, and so, at least for me, it was not a big picture. It was simply, okay, here I am and this is the situation and that's what this is what I need to deal with. It's a matter of, you know, I've got certain things that I'm supposed to do and then I've got... Um, one of them is try to survive, and so that's that's what you do. Um, the, uh, oh, it was about um, two weeks after the lieutenant was killed, 
I had a very sad experience. Um, uh, one night I, I killed a Chinese lieutenant. And standard procedure uh, the next morning was to go through his clothing, look for any kind of intelligence information that might be of benefit to the intelligence section. And in his belongings, I discovered a picture of a young woman and a child. And uh, it, was, it was a very saddening thing to me to realize what I had done to that family. And of course, I, I kind of related to the, to the American lieutenant who was killed uh, a month or so uh, before that. Um, but I, it just it made me very sad. Um, Yeah. And at the time, is there remorse at the time then you're saying, or was it that years no, later? No, 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 it was right then. Mm -hmm. I mean, it hit me right then. Um, Did that affect your actions going forward? Or no, was no. Was it easier the second time? I mean, as it wasn't, it, no, it wasn't any easier. I, I, I could overcome that because I realized that, you know, it's the kind of thing of kill or be killed, and so I could overcome that. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. I'm sad that it happened, but I want to keep living, and so I'm going to keep doing my job and keep going. And if it means I have to kill people, then I have to kill people. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's just kind of a saddening thing to realize what you've done and what's going on. And, you know, you, you wonder if, if he was any uh, uh, crazier about being there than you were, and you doubt it. You know, it can be a bad experience on for everybody. Um, well, you know, the movies make war kind of look like glorious, but there's no glory in war. Um, not really. Um, no, you know, when you if you analyze it rather coldly, it's it's a heck of a note that we humans have to be engaged in that sort of thing. I mean. Uh, it seems that we uh, that we do at least so far we have been, um, but um, you know it seems to me that that's something that we humans really ought not to experience if we could avoid it. But I understand that things can happen that you know uh, well you take the Second World War I think there was a lot more justification probably for that than there has been for some of the engagements we we've, we've been in since then. And I think there were bad things happening to people in the world, that, and somebody needed to do something about it. But um, if you take the current war in Iraq, I think it's very questionable as to whether or not we should have um, invaded Iraq. Um, so, so, how many months did you say you were in Korea? I was in seven in Korea, seven months. Were you in combat pretty much the whole time there? Uh, no, only about five months of it. Uh, about five months of it. So, were there casualties sustained though during those times? Yes. Were, you, were medics helping people? Did you ever yes. have anybody that was hurt or? Uh, no. No. Um, I was around people who who got killed, and then there were some uh, who weren't in my immediate vicinity, vicinity, but they were part of our company, and uh, stepping on landmines, being hit. By artillery shells, small arms fire. Um, one of the pictures I have is four of us in Korea, and one of the guys in the picture I heard rumor that he lost his legs, but I don't know that that's. I've never. I don't know where he lives now. I don't know anything about him now. Um, Looking back, um, David, you know, what, 55 years now? Yeah, 56. Yeah. Um, do, do you think our society, well, number one, even remembers? Or it, it, I, I guess my question is the significance of Korea with, you know, with the way things are today and the, the important part I feel that it played in our history. But um, I guess maybe I can ask it like this. What, what, what should our country know about Korea and the conflict over there, the war? What should we remember about it?
Maybe a lot of us don't remember. Um, no, one of the things, and I don't, I don't mean to, to downplay the current situation in Iraq, but, you know, we do a body count in Iraq. And the number is now somewhere around 3,600 or something like that. And, and you know, we, we lost more than 35,000 people in a couple, in two years or so in, in Korea. And so when you're talking about numbers, or in the Second World War, and you take the Second World War, and the numbers, you know, now that that's not to say that it that it's you know that it's all right or that you know the numbers are small and all, but but you know have some perspective. I mean, um, even in Vietnam, it, we lost a lot of people, but it took a long time to do that. That Vietnam conflict went on for several years. Um, that's a real good point. The, the, yeah. um, now, th there's no way that civilians or people who have not been in combat, there's no way that they can understand or experience that, that combat, they have that combat experience. For, for one thing, you soon realize that you're under constant threat of death or maiming, and there's no getting away from it. It doesn't go away at night. It doesn't go away anytime. Once you've, once you've tasted and, and been there, then it's there, and it's there constantly. It was with me all the way in Korea. It took me several months to, to get over the, the nerves, the jitters, and that sort of thing. Um, so that, you know, being under constant threat of, of death or maiming, uh, also being called upon to kill people, which are, Americans are not, that isn't our normal uh, way of growing up. So... Those are a couple of things that, that, you know, that are quite different, and uh, there's just simply no way of, of, of duplicating those. Um, I can remember even, oh, 1954, um, I can remember, well, a jet plane at that time, a jet plane coming low, and, and at that time they were flying fairly low around places. It sounds like an artillery shell coming in, right? Just the first thing. And I can remember being at junior college in, in biology class, and a jet came over, and I'm under the table on the floor, and everybody's looking around, and what, you know, what's wrong here? Well, it's just automatic reaction to that sound. I watched in, a, in Camp Gordon, Georgia in 1953, there were several of us out on parade ground, and a jet came in low, unexpectedly. We didn't, well, several of us in that group took off to find cover. Other guys didn't. They were just out there looking at us and wondering what was going on. Well, it's just kind of an automatic thing that you do because you, you, you know, uh, you're tuned to that's how you survive. Sure. Um, so those are kinds of things that you just can't get, um, uh, you can't, you know, you can't know as a civilian. Um, are you proud that you're a, a veteran of Korea? Uh, yes. Um, I would say that I am, but I never joined the American Legion. I never joined any veterans' organizations, um, and I still haven't. Um, but uh, yes, I would say that I'm proud that I was a Korean veteran. Have people thanked you for your service? Um, as a matter of fact, um, a Korean did. Um, I'm trying to think. It's been in the last few years somewhere. I was on vacation, and he was on. He was in a touring group, and we were talking, visiting some bus stop or something, and he thanked me for for um, having come to the defense of South Korea. Um, well, Korea was pretty much wedged between World War II and Vietnam. And yes, uh, I think people probably had enough of war after World War II, and along comes Korea, and maybe it was hard to take it seriously in this country, or. You know, I don't know. It's uh, it, yeah, it's a strange thing. I mean, you know, the Second World War was a total society effort. Mm -hmm. You know, everything. I mean, everything was, was focused on winning the Second World War. Um, now, in, you know, when Korea came, it was not the same kind of thing. That is, we weren't under the threat of, uh, that we were. Um, sure, we had troops over there, and they were fighting and this sort of thing, but it wasn't like, like there was a monster out there that was going to come and get us all. Uh, so I think that was, that was part of it. Um, you know, something else that occurs to me that people sometimes forget 
And that is that during the early years of the Second World War, we had no assurance that we were going to win that war. We would like to think that we were going to. We tried, we told ourselves we were going to, but the war went badly for us for the first few years. And it wasn't really until Normandy, until the, until the landing, and then after that, then we began to, you know, there was, uh, there was some indication that we were going to win the war. But until then, we were getting beaten in, in uh, the Pacific badly. Um, and people forget that. Now, I don't think, you see, I don't think we had that kind of a threat in Korea. We weren't af afraid of being overrun or having, you know, uh, of losing that war. Um, you think the fighting in Korea was different than Vietnam or World War II? The war, war. There'll be slight differences of the war. We learned some things in the Second World War. Now, you know, I mentioned where we teenagers and we played the war games. Well, we also watched a lot of movies about the Second World War. I would say that that most of us, many of us, uh, twenty-year-olds in Korea, already knew a lot about warfare from from our experiences as teenagers with the Second World War, and so it was not particularly foreign to us. Now. Um, the, you know, that's, that's one thing. Uh, there are other, uh, well, I think Vietnam was different because of the terrain also. It was, it, it, the terrain made a lot of things. I mean, when you're working in a jungle, that's one thing. When you're working all the time in the mountains, that's another thing. Now, the Second World War, of course, you had a much wider range. You had people who worked in the mountains. You had people who, who were in uh, jungles. I mean, they were hot, cold everywhere. So that was, you know, it was really a more uh, a wider uh, thing. Um, what kind of weapon did you have in Korea? M1. Now, they also had carbines, and they had Browning automatic rifles, and we also had 30 caliber machine guns. We also had 57 recoilless, 57 millimeter recoilless rifles and 75 millimeter recoilless rifles. Our outfit was a powerhouse when it comes to armor and uh, to um, uh, munitions. We had tanks, we had armored personnel carriers, we had these other things I mentioned, and so we had a lot of firepower. Not not too many men, but a lot of firepower. Uh, but I preferred the M1 because it was just a good, solid, standard uh, weapon. Uh, the carbine, of course, could you could fire a single shot or you could also fire automatic, and a lot of people like the carbines. But um, and so we're in Korea because of the threat of communism. Yes, that was uh, that was the way it was. Yes, that was the way it was, it was interpreted. Basically, MacArthur is at the helm of all this. Or? He was until until he went to uh, the Yalu River and kept talking about the. Th about having getting the Chinese and they weren't going to get involved and you know he was trying to fold in a third world war perhaps until Harry Truman fired him but and I must say I think um, I think that MacArthur and I don't know whether people have talked much about it but I think that it was it was either a blunder he either had awfully bad intelligence or he just didn't give a damn about the intelligence when he pu pushed the troops up to the Yalu River and saying, you know, all the Chinese won't come in. Well, you know, they came in with lots of divisions that were sitting just across the river. And that's when the Chosin Reservoir problem came about. That's when we really got kicked back to the 38th parallel. Um, and so, I, you know, I think somebody made a, made a big mistake there. Uh, looking back on the Chosin Reservoir, did we lose that? Quote battle where we re do we retreated right? I mean, uh, push back. Yes, we yes in a sense we lost it. Uh, it. It was a matter of trying to survive. It was a matter of pulling out as many troops as we could of the survivors. Uh, we were far we, outnumbered. Uh, yes, and we weren't in a position to really defend anything. And, and yes, we were. We had our lines were stretched way too far. I mean, they're all the way up through North Korea. So our lines were stretched, and of course the Chinese moved in. They got up in the higher ground in the hills. And so when we started withdraw, they're sitting up there just like shooting ducks in a water barrel. So I think that, you know, it was a withdrawal, and 
Well, if you go back to the Second World War, Dunkirk was, <laughs> but Dunkirk was a big one. It was much bigger than Korea, but it was the same kind of situation. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the, managing to get as many survivors out as possible was a victory of sorts. Now, but of course, then we did get back and, and we managed to hold things up together around the 38th parallel where it all began anyhow. So what, when did you leave Korea and why? In January of, of uh, 1952. And that's because the 24th Infantry Division was pulled out. The whole division was pulled out and replaced, as I recall, by the 40th Division. So we were all pulled out as a, as a one unit, went back to Japan. I was in Japan then for about six months until June or so of 52. And again, in Korea when you were there, was the weather a factor for, you said it, rain, it was cold, but did it get bitterly cold? And, yeah, and then, it was bitterly cold. And you were talking about keeping your hands warm and all that? Yes. Um, it's just, you know, under those conditions, I, I don't see how a guy could even function. I don't know if it was that, as cold as it was at the Chosen, but it probably was. Uh, yeah, it, it, it may have been a little colder there. But the, hill, the mountains are a little higher, but... Um, I mean, how do you function day by day, keep your sanity, keep your wits about you? Is there morale boosters? I mean, how do you get through all that as a young man? Or has that been so long ago, it's kind of like, well, we did it, we did it, but do you remember these things? Do you um, these things? No, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say, except that I mean, personally I just felt, well, okay, it's something that I'm going to keep doing. It's just like putting one step in front of the other, and you just keep going, and it's going to end someday. I mean, it's not going to go on forever. Um, are, you, are you conscious of fighting for your country at these times, or... Does no. it get just become a matter of survival? No, it it's it's uh, it, it's much more focused in in terms of who's where doing what, and you got somebody over there that you've got to help or or protect or uh, support this sort of thing. Um, you know, you got to do this or they're going to get you. Uh, it's that kind of thing. So no, I I didn't see it as any big. I mean, I wasn't. Well, I know that literature, uh, there's a lot of literature about the communists and all of this kind of thing, but uh, that didn't, uh, you know, I didn't look at the Chinese and say, oh, those are communists and, and this sort of thing. Is there a patriotic spirit in combat? Mm. Um, there probably is for some people. I think there's, there's difference. I, I was... When you mentioned that, I was just reminded of somebody who volunteered for a lot of these patrols that we did. He, he'd go beg people to let him take their place on these patrols. And some of us looked at him as, you know, you're crazy, man. Uh, but, but uh, and I don't know whether he just did that because of the thrill of it or, or not. Now, sure, there were some very patriotic people in, in our group. And, and um, uh, yeah, and they were very patriotic. You see them as veterans also. Sure. Um, and, and I don't know, um, well, I suppose I might have been a, a lot more patriotic back then and before than I, than I was later on because I went to university and I began to learn some things about our country that, you know, it, it wasn't quite what it's been cracked up to be in our high school history books and such things. Um, and since then, I've learned that we've uh, done a lot of other things that we haven't been told about uh, until later. And uh, um, so, you know, I have, to, I have to have some caution about my patriotism. I'm still patriotic, and I still love the United States. But uh, I don't believe that the United States does everything right and is some kind of savior of the world. Well, along those lines, what does freedom mean to you as a veteran? And and the price of freedom? Um, I think, well, I think freedom is very important. However, I also recognize that there have been a lot of people and organizations in our country throughout my lifetime that were very anti-freedom 
and they're with us today and perhaps in, in a very high places and even stronger than they were before. A lot that's been going on since the Iraq war started uh, is, is anti-freedom. I mean, not disclosing information, uh, disclosing disinformation, stonewalling various things, not being open with the public about things, um, censorship, um, wiretapping. There's a lot of things that have been going on. How, about, how do you feel about the price of freedom, though? I mean, a lot of men lost their lives. Um, and do you think that today we're seeing the result of what happened in World War II in Korea? I mean, are, are we losing that in our country? Or are we losing what we fought for? I, I think it's been seriously eroded, yes. I'm afraid that we, that we have been. Uh, the, uh, losing much of the freedom that we had. Uh, you know, we, we now find out that we weren't as free as we thought we were back in the 60s and other things. We had a lot of, a lot of bad things going on. Um, and it seems to me that, it, that it's tended to get worse in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I think we have some serious issues and some serious problems here. How about the American flag? What does that mean and represent to you as a veteran? Um, okay, I would have to say that per se the flag doesn't really mean a lot to me. I understand the, its symbolism and I, I understand all of this. Um, but I would have to say that I'm, I'm really more concerned about substance than about... Um, a flag or, or what it represents and this sort of thing. Um, and I think we have to be, you know, one can get caught up in these kinds of things and not think through the problems and what we ought to be doing about the problems, but, um, you know, just waving the flag and, and everything and, and saying, oh, we, well, uh, we mustn't question this, that, or the other. We mustn't question our president or our Congress or uh, the military leaders and this sort of thing. Um, David, do you think there's things that happen in combat that you'll never talk about? Um, yes. Um, yeah, and not, uh, not so much terrible things, but um, well, let me see if I can give you an example. Yeah, I can about somebody who was an awarded a silver star. Now, I think it was the ego of our company commander that got in the way because the guy didn't do what, he was, what they said he did. But it's nice for your unit to have a lot of medals. And so, um, you know, the story was puffed up in terms of what he did. And, and um, uh, he just, he did a damn fool thing and got killed. He was not leading something. Um, so I, there are those kinds of things. Now, and, and of course I won't talk about them because I, you know, it would be very injurious perhaps to the family and this sort of thing. So there's no point. What's to be achieved by doing that? But um, How would you define combat? Um, it, hmm. um, it's probably an experience that humans ought to avoid if they can, um, because it's not a um, it's not really a good experience. I mean. Sometimes there are perhaps a little bit of good feeling in some of it, but overall it's just a bad experience. Um, Did you ever see Saving Private Ryan? Yes. The first part of that movie, they depict the Omaha Beach landing. In yes. 
this combat come close? I mean, was that a good portrayal of maybe? I know it was Hollywood, but yeah. is that? Uh, yes, and of course, the Omaha Beach was one of the worst situations. I mean, it was it was worse than probably anything that we had in Korea. Um, I mean, there were, well, that's another thing when you talk about numbers. I mean, there were as many as 8,000 killed on Omaha Beach in a matter of a few hours. Now, you don't, many people don't conceptualize what 8,000 people are. And you, but you think about it, and you talk about 10, and then do 100, and then do 1,000, and then talk about 8,000 people, and all of a sudden they're here and alive, and a few hours later, they're all dead. Now, we're just not, I mean, you know, that's beyond, it's almost beyond belief. I noticed that some of the veterans that talked about that, you know, it, it was very difficult for them to, to believe. It's un, almost unbelievable to see that many people kill that quickly. Can a person be trained to kill, like in a combat situation? How are you, how do they prepare oh. you? Are you killer instinct instilled or... Are you, learn to hate the enemy? I mean, how does that happen? Well, I think probably what I learned, uh, I learned the, the from the Second World War of a matter of kill or be killed. And so, you know, it's not something that hits you all of a sudden. It's something that you did learn a little bit earlier, and you began to, to look at it and say, okay, you know, it's, un, it's unpleasant. It's not a good deal to have to do this, but the alternative is to get killed or maimed. And so, if you're in that situation, then that's what you do. And you don't hesitate. You don't, you know, it's not something that you have to weigh while you're there in the thick of it. You've already made up your mind ahead of time. And so um, that's why I think in some cases the, the Second World War for teenage, us teenage boys was a learning experience of things that, that came along in Korea. Um, I think we learned things, you know, from the Second World War that, that, stood us in, in good stead in, in Korea. But um, um, I, well, I can remember thinking after when I came back from Korea that I really ought to get involved in, in doing something about let's stop this war business. Let's not have wars anymore. But I didn't really follow through and do much with that. But um, are you proud that you're a Korea War veteran? Um, yes, I would say that I am. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't feel badly toward myself for, for being a, a Korean War veteran. And, and uh, um, I have, you know, I still have mixed feelings about being in the war and, and, and being in combat and all of that. But, uh, you know, since... I was there, and I did what I was supposed to do, and I survived and came back, and so okay, it's that's fine. Now I don't need people to, um, you know, to to um, praise me or that sort of thing. Um, well, that's that's good. Yeah, people have thanked you though for your service. Uh, yes, um, I just happened to think of something else. I wrote a letter to, letter to Harry Truman. <laughs> when I was in Korea, um, just really telling him that I was very much interested in the GI Bill, and I, I sure wanted to take advantage of it when I got out of the service. <laughs> but, you know, being from this area, I, I felt like I knew Harry Truman. Um, um, That's good. I'm, I'm kind of getting towards the end here. I just... Um Okay. Probably just wrap this up, but uh, as far as you, your time in Korea, fighting, um, um, anything else you can tell me about the experiences with the Chinese? Or you mentioned they were young, or you know there were numbers of them. I mean, did they blow bugles? Did they try to intimidate you? When um, they attacked? Or oh yeah. Was it nighttime, daytime when they attacked? Um, well, it it could be both, although nighttime was seemed to be, you know, that, that's what you, that's what I remember more and, and seemed to, um, but because it, in the daytime it can be very withering fire attacking. <laughs> um, and, 
Okay. Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that there's much more um, little bits and pieces, and they sometimes hit things that I hadn't even thought about. Um, I well, incidentally, I I wrote letters to my wife. Uh, who, she was my girlfriend at the time, and my mother when I was in Korea. In fact, the three years I was in the army. And they saved all those letters. And only recently, earlier this year, I started going through them for the first time since I came back from, from Korea, from the military. What were your thoughts reading those letters? Um, <laughs> my thoughts were, uh, how could anybody be this young and immature? <laughs> uh, there were, much of them, many of them were love letters to my girlfriend. Um, and then there were other things just all over the countryside. I mean, talk about the hard times during Korea. When you're not, there. not much. A, a little bit. I noticed that that, and I, I knew before I ever went back to read them that many of them were sanitized. That is, you didn't, you didn't, you just didn't tell folks back home. Um, but in some cases, you did relate things. I also remembered, and I, and I knew it before I ever got to it that I that I didn't write a letter almost the whole time of December of 1951 because I was too cold. I was on the mountaintop and, and it was cold. And, you know, I just was not in a position or a mood to be writing letters. It was a matter of trying to stay warm enough and survive and get through day by day. So I knew that before I ever got to the, there was going to be a big blank spot. And I knew that it worried my mother, but um, I just couldn't help it. I do notice, I, I do remember telling my mother that that I was, you know, that I knew what I was doing and I was all right. I was going to be all right. I, I sent those kinds of things to her uh, in the letters. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing all right. at the end of the interview. And you saw it in the film yesterday, but I'm going to ask you to give me a salute when I tell you into the camera from where you're seated. Is that mm -hmm. okay? Yes. Okay, David, right into the camera. Go ahead. I'm right into the camera. Excellent.